Dear Father in heaven, I ask in the name of Jesus as an act of mercy to be with me now and help me as I carry out this spiritual work. Take control of my mind, my faculties. Help me not only to speak the truth, but speak it with the right attitude. Give me the right words, the right sequence of thought. And let your spirit take these words with conviction to the hearts of your hearers. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our subject is, and I won't hold you long, Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible. Daniel chapter 6, reading from verse 1. Daniel 6, reading from verse 1. Our subject is Mission Impossible. For the final time, how many of you have Bibles? May I see them? Bibles, Bibles, well, not bad at all. Thank you, thank you. Make your Bible an extension of yourself. Daniel 6, reading from verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the cold kingdom, and over them three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give account unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. And this is remarkable that these 120 men, plus the two presidents, they embarked on a search for evidence to put Daniel in trouble, to blacken his name, to, to cast aspersions on his professional and personal record. And being the leaders of the government, you must assume that they had all the search engines available to them back then. And otherwise says that they put spies on Daniel's trail to follow him, to just discover one fault. It was a mission driven by satanic energy. Let us overthrow this man because we are jealous of him. Now Daniel, you must remember, was a member of a captive race. Brought there by Nebuchadnezzar. Now the uh, Persians are in charge. But still a member of a captive race nonetheless. He did his work so faithfully. That the king thought to put him in charge of the entire kingdom. Even as Pharaoh made Joseph the highest in Egypt next to to him and quite naturally this generated resentment and jealousy in those who are I suppose native born Persians and they tried to find one fault with this professional performance then these presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom that is his work they found nothing but they could find none occasion nor fall for as much as he was faithful. What is faithfulness? It protected Daniel from this illegal probe into his professional background and his personal background. What was this faithfulness? Daniel. You know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. When I was an academic counselor, I would always tell students, you don't need to be a genius to do well in school. You just need to be disciplined. You need to be focused. You need to remind yourself constantly, why am I here? You need to have a very clear, distinct, defined goal and purpose and reason for spending so many thousands of dollars and so many hours and days and months and years of nervous energy and mental energy. You must be clear in your mind. And then you commit yourself to that as though you are immune to distraction. Daniel was faithful. 
He came early, left late. Had no problem going the extra mile and then one more mile. Always willing to ask, what else can I do? How can I help? Always on time. Assignments well done. Attitude respectful. Almost no complaints. Reliable. Dependable. Trustworthy. Brimful of integrity. Micro integrity. In every little thing, integrity. And the Persian king realized this and he understood, listen, I don't care if this man is a member of a captive race or some different ethnic group, I want those qualities at the head of my kingdom. Now when God's people, and we're fond of making excuses why we don't advance for one reason or another. I am from this place or the next or the color of my skin or the height of my whatever. And we forget that if God wants you at the head of a kingdom, your skin color is not a problem. The texture of your hair is not a problem. Same thing for Joseph. He was a slave. Ended up as the highest ruler in Egypt next to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh effectively put him in charge of the entire country virtually without asking anything. Why? Because of the way Joseph did his business. Verse 5 of Daniel 6. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning what? The law. Well, this is what they were saying. That man will not disappoint his God. There is nothing we can do to get him to be unfaithful to God. So what we have to do is to devise a plan whereby faithfulness to God constitutes a crime. And then we're certain we have him because he will remain faithful to his God even if we come up with a ruse, uh, some strategy that makes faithfulness to his God a crime. He will still be faithful. That's how we'll get him. Now if someone has to get you, let them get you that way. Don't let them succeed in getting you on the point of unfaithfulness to God because they dangle some bait before your eyes. And you momentarily take a vacation from faithfulness to God. They understood this man will not disappoint his God. I'll ask you a question. Don't answer me. Is that the way we are determined to serve our God? That's a private reflection for you. No matter what. Sometimes employees like to threaten Adventists with Sabbath work and you don't come on Sabbath, I dismiss you. And here's a man or a woman with a family. And you're thinking of, I have a family, have a responsibility. God will understand. Well, let me tell you something. There's some things God just does not understand. As omniscient as he is, he does not understand disobedience. There is no excuse. There is no justification. You can present to God for unfaithfulness. And so they found nothing in Daniel. Having come up with this brilliant idea, they took it to Darius, passed the decree, anyone who prays anyone else beside you in 30 days will be thrown into the lions. Darius said, fine. He signs it. And you know, when something was signed by the Medes and the Persians, it could not be changed. So Daniel was found praying as usual, taken to the lion's den. And in verse 17 of Daniel 6, the Bible says, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel, O king, live forever. By the way, when people tell you forever in the Bible always means forever, ask them, what did Daniel mean? By O king, live forever. O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me. 
No, he gives the reason. God always has a purpose. God is never purposeless. Daniel gives the reason for as much as before him, what does he say? Innocency was found where? In me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. What is Daniel saying? Is he claiming absolute perfection? No, no one can claim that. Daniel examines his behavior in the light of this drama that had been swirling about him perhaps for several months. And as he looks at himself, Daniel is aware he has done nothing wrong. And so he says, before God, innocency was, innocency was found in me. Not I found it, he found it. Remember, they are without fault before the throne of God, Revelation 14, verse 5. They are without fault. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, Jude 24. If you do these things, you shall never fall. Innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. This mission to find fault in Daniel failed. It was a mission impossible from the start. Sometimes the, uh, the, the Pharisees and the scribes embarked on a similar mission with respect to Christ, and Christ said to them in John 8, 45, which of you? Or at 46, convinceth me of sin. John 8, 45, which of you? No one could convince Christ of sin. He himself was able to say, this prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Now, let me put a challenge to you and to myself. Ellen White writes, in the Zara of Ages, page 664, paragraph 4, Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to the Father or to God as he was. The condition is plainly laid out why was christ so successful in his spiritual battles he was absolutely surrendered to the father without one microscopic part of reservation absolutely surrendered and ellen white informs us his perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if we will be in subjection to god as he was in Gospel Workers, page 445, paragraph 2, Ellen White writes, Every soul who gains eternal life must be like Christ, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. I want you, I know you've heard me, but I don't know if you've heard me. Every soul that gains eternal life must be like Christ. Holy, harmless, undefiled separate from sinners the problem with us i guess it's a guess we set many goals in life it could be few of us set as a goal christ likeness now we set decency <clears throat> excuse me one goal is to stay out of prison one goal is to get ahead in my career one goal is to get married one goal is to complete some degree the most important goal you and I can set is a goal to be like Christ. This is not a fairy tale. This is not science fiction. This is what is required of us. In Education, page 18, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes, Higher than the highest human thoughts can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, God-likeness is the goal to be reached. And then she says, success in any line requires a definite aim. You must have a goal. Success in any line, it works for the sinner and the saint, requires a definite aim. What are you shooting at? Christ-likeness. 
Am I shooting at being better than my brother? No. I am shooting at what God will have me aim for, Christ-likeness. So that when the world trains its searchlight of examination upon us, it will find nothing. Now it may go back to the past and find some things, but God doesn't recognize that. Forgiveness makes that ineligible for consideration. We must be willing to stand up to the scrutiny of this world. As it was for Daniel, it will be for us in the last days. And we're fond of saying we're living in the last days, and we're correct. No fault in his professional life, no fault in his personal life. And we need to reflect on that. This is not something out of reach. This is what is actually required. It is difficult to get Christians to believe, Adventist Christians, that the plan of salvation, its overall purpose is to restore. What? Restore what? The image of God which was put into man at what point? Creation. This, among other, of course, is also the purpose of the gospel to, to bring the entire universe back under Jesus Christ. Sin caused problems that we're not even aware of. Calvary not only makes us secure, Calvary makes the unfallen worlds secure. Calvary secures the entire universe, not just this little world. God's purpose through the gospel, which was his response to this catastrophe called sin, part of it was to and remains the restoration of the image of God in us. And there is no sin in God's image. But my brothers and sisters, it must become an ambition. Something I want. When I was counseling at that medical school in the United States, University of Michigan, large medical school, I counseled students who'd stay up all night, you know, pursuing this PhD, PhD, MD, but they, they, they'd make sacrifices, sacrifices, because they wanted to, this degree, because they understood what security the degree would bring, so-called security. And they, some, some got divorced in medical school. Some went on psychotropic medication pursuing this thing ravenously if Christians would pursue the character of Christ that way the world would very soon have an example of what victorious Christian living is all about and so God tells us seek ye first the kingdom of God and that text is not found in Revelation so there's no there's no way we can say that's symbolic it's not in Daniel or Zechariah or Joel it's Matthew seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness so that any attempt the devil makes to undermine you or me will be amounting to a mission that's impossible. During the reign of Idi Amin in Uganda, 1970 to 79, part of the terror of that reign was his soldiers were almost undisciplined, uh, no controls. They'd go into houses, take what they want, take girls, and take them away. And, and they came. And Adventism was banned, so the church went on the ground, and it grew more quickly than it is growing when it grew when the, 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 uh, that despotic reign fell. They were baptizing people at night in bathtubs. That's exciting. The church can grow that way now. But for some reason, we prefer to be persecuted before we grow. Makes no sense. And some soldiers came to this church member's home looking for Adventists to arrest them. Threatened them, leave the church or we shoot you. So they were asking around, we're Adventists. And they said, there's an old man who lives next door. He's an Adventist. The soldiers got there. They're going to get him. But the neighbor said, don't go and waste your time. Don't waste your time. There is nothing you can do, the neighbor said to the soldiers, to change that man. 
you will have to kill him. That old man, I've lived next to him for decades, that old man will not change. You've got to kill him, and even in death he won't change. And the soldiers said, well, I'll leave him. And they went looking for somebody else. My friends, let us give off a very clear message to people. If you're trying to involve him in some chicanery on the job, you're wasting time. If you're trying to get this person to live outside of the principles found so clearly in scripture, you are wasting time. It's mission impossible. As it was for those Persian administrators who search long and hard to find incriminating evidence against Brother Daniel. My brothers and sisters, whatever else you do, I don't care how many degrees you earn, they will not get you into the kingdom. That's not a strike against degrees. That's just putting degrees in a proper place. I don't care what your job is, how high it is, that is not what gets you into the kingdom. When God was preparing the Israelites to leave Egypt, and he gave instructions for the splashing of the blood on the doorposts, the message was simple. When I see what? The blood. Not the certificates hanging on the wall, even though they're not a sin. Not when I see the, 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 the CBE, is that one of your, mm -hmm. or the OBE or whatever it is, or the knighthood. When I see the blood, I am simply stressing priorities. You know, Christ talks about the weightier matters of the law. When I see the blood, the blood does not represent death. The blood represents life. The life is in the blood. Death is the means by which the blood is poured out. Life is in the blood when I see that which represents the life of the ultimate sacrificial lamb. I'll pass over you. Whether you are an Israelite or an Egyptian. The righteousness of Christ is our admission. You know, uh, yesterday during the Sabbath service, I guess some people went out for whatever reason or another. And as they were coming back, there was a young man at the door checking something. I guess he was checking for some legal reason to admit you to the service. Perhaps you had to have something hanging around your neck or something. God is also checking. And what is he looking for? The righteousness of Christ. The sinless life of Christ. The perfect life of Christ. Now, for those of you who may be afraid, am I saying that we must have absolute perfection? I'm not saying that. I am saying that we must combine the constantly available power of God with our best effort. Because when conversion changes your mind, you think differently. Now, there's some things you just don't want to do. It springs from within because a different spirit is within you. You just don't want to do it anymore. And you try not to. You avoid friends. You avoid circumstances. That's your effort and mine. And then God gives us that invisible power through the word. Obedience is a means of releasing power into the life. Obedience to the word. And he gives us that power as we make our own effort. Not to be saved. This is what a saved person does. Putting distance between himself, herself, and those habits that used to offend God and break his heart. Because now your priority is, please God, not me. And a man or a woman whose life's passion is to please God is a man or a woman who puts distance between himself, herself, and sin. And so I say to you again, and I'll close. Let the devil embark upon a mission impossible if as you sit you say to yourself with a form of self-contained embarrassment you know if the devil looks now he'll find everything he needs okay but in a moment that can be removed did you hear me 
it, as long as it takes you to say, Father, forgive me. Wiped out. God has a delete button. Gone. Placed on Christ. And at the end of the thousand years, when his ultimate scapegoat, he, that's where he'll be dumped. You and I can walk out of this place with a sense of spiritual cleanliness. It is not how long you have served God. It is how faithfully for the time you have known him. It is not how much you know. Even though the more you know, the more you understand God. It is what you do with what you know. In that sense, God is fair to all. And so again, I encourage you from my heart. Let us strive to be like Christ. Let us develop a, 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 a hatred for sin consistent with the very first promise in the Bible, Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. The first promise in the Bible contains a, a, a hatred for sin. Ask God for hatred for sin. I got an email from a young lady from Indonesia. I was there last December. And she asked me something. I don't remember what it was. So I told her, look, stop asking God for money and husbands. and you know, Stop. Just ask God for the next 21 days, ask him for two things. You must always ask for forgiveness of sins, even if you're not sure you did anything. Lord, just in case, forgive. You remember David? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if the enemy wicked thing in me. Because I look, I see nothing. But when you look, you see everything. Always pray, forgive me. Number two, I said, just pray for the Holy Spirit. That's all. Don't ask God, give me traveling mercies. Don't ask him, send me food. Pray for two things. She sent me an email. I would forgotten about that. She sent me an email. She said, she said, I am a changed person. She said, you know, you, the miracles God did for me in that period, she said, I did what you said. I set aside everything else, and I prayed just for the Spirit. And she said, I have become a different person. I want to recommend to you, as nervous as it may make you, we have this belief about God. If I don't ask God for food, I'll starve. You see, that's how we treat God. If you walk from this hotel downtown, you probably would not pray, Lord, grant me traveling mercies. But if you get into a car, you pray. That's the way we think about God. If we get into a plane, grant me traveling mercies. But if you could walk from here to the United States, we probably wouldn't pray, grant me traveling mercies. Because I can handle the walking, but I can't handle the flying. That's how we view God. If I don't ask him for food, I'll starve. Forgetting that God said, all these things shall be what? Add it unto you. Try this for the next 21 days. The same amount of time it took Gabriel to get through to answer Daniel's prayer. Psychologists say if you can do something for 21 days, it can become a habit. Pray for two things. Don't ask God to bless you on an exam. Just study, you'll be fine. Is he that keeps your brain working anyhow? Don't ask for anything. Ask for to forgive me. Grant me your spirit. 21 days. Pray from your heart. See what happens in your life. Don't be afraid. Try it. You know, there's something called urban... jump off bridges and people people do all kinds of risky things 
looking for thrill. Well, take a risk. Stop asking for food. Take a risk. Stop asking for, Lord, help me to pass this exam. Take a risk. Stop it for 21 days. And just pray for the Spirit. You see, it's the Spirit that helps you pass the exam. The Spirit is the one who controls the work on this earth. That's what Jesus said. If any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Romans 8, 9. So pray. You see, the Spirit has everything. But pray just for the Spirit. Whether he brings you food or not. Pray for the Spirit. Always forgiveness. And see what happens in your life. Of course, praying for the Spirit must go hand in hand with the document the Spirit offered. So you can understand more of the Spirit. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, John 6, 63, they are spirit and they are life. What spirit? The spirit of God. I want to ask you this morning to make a commitment to live an upright life. Simple. Regardless of what your friends decide, your spouse, your children, I want you as an individual to make a commitment to live an upright life as I do the same thing. And so my commitment right now in your presence as witnesses is that God will help me from day to day to honor him by simply being faithful in Bible commentary volume 7 page 974 paragraph 3 Ella White writes it is not necessary for us to conquer to get strength for a month we just need to overcome day from day that's it so we say Lord today as I travel to wherever Wolverton Manchester, Wales, help me to be conscious that I'm your child, I'm your representative, and my life reflects on you negatively or positively. Help me to so live that I make it evident that godliness, godlikeness is my goal. Today, Father, help me to live like that. That's my, on the plane flying back to Amsterdam, then the U.S., from the airport home, a consciousness that God requires me to live a certain way. That's my commitment. How many of you will say with me, Father, I commit myself today to live an upright life today so that any attempt on the devil to find something against me today will be a mission impossible. How many will say that? Do you mean it from your heart? Do you mean it from your heart? Stand up and let's pray. Remember, practice makes perfect. You do that every day. After a while, you enjoy doing it. Practice makes perfect whether what you practice is good or bad. Habits are hard to break whether the habit is good or bad. There are some rules that function whether they're good or bad. Daily commitment to be like Christ. Is there anyone under the sound of my voice who wants to say, Preacher, I hear you. I've made the commitment. There are special circumstances in my life. I need real power from above. Remember me in your prayers. Can I see your hand? Okay. Remember, as you raise your hand, I'll pray for you, yes. But the most important prayer you can offer is to pray for yourself. Always remember that. Because God invited you personally, come to the throne of grace. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Dear Father in heaven, I come to you as your son and your servant to thank you for this tremendous privilege of fellowshipping with your people. Those for whom you shed your precious, you sent your son to shed his precious blood. 
Father, we measure our value to you by Calvary. Lord, I pray from my heart that you would take the words I've spoken and apply them to every heart, to every need. Our goal, Father, is to be like your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he lived as a human being that he may help us understand that that which you accomplished in him, you can accomplish through us. We can live victoriously one day at a time. Your servant Ellen White says, without a vital connection with God through surrender of ourselves to him moment by moment, we shall be overcome. Father, what we're calling for today is a moment by moment surrender. Please, Father, grant us your spirit that he may enable us to live this way, a conscious, purposeful, directed Christian life, moment by moment, aware of what is required of us from above. Lord, we have different backgrounds, different experiences, and we have different spiritual needs. Remember those, dear God, who struggle and struggle, but whose desire really is to serve you. Lord, be particularly merciful to them and give them power. Forgive us for our lapses, mistakes, sins, the atrocities we commit spiritually that have caused you such cosmic embarrassment. Forgive us, Father. Put it behind you. Cast it into the depths of the sea and view us as though we had not sinned. A concept we need to understand when we forgive one another. Please, Father, let any attempt the devil makes to find errors in our lives amount to a mission impossible. For those of us who can make the commitment to pray for the Holy Spirit for 21 days, as we pray, hear our prayers and answer quickly with blessings to demonstrate your approval of this spiritual exercise. Bless the young, bless the parents, bless the friends that have come to support us. Father, bless the workers in this place who've observed this from day to day. And among all that you do, dear God, save us in your kingdom when you come without the loss of one. I pray with the support of my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name and for his sake, let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you.